What's up, everybody? It is your sis and your friend, Crystal Whitaker, right here on the Morning Jam Podcast, where we talk about any and everything. Personal, old snaps and claps. It's a dang good day to talk about a few things. So let's get into it. What's up, everybody? It is your sis and your friend, Crystal Whitaker, right here on the Morning Jam Podcast. And I am super excited to have my super guest, the one and only Bishop Oz. How's it going? What's going on? What's happening, everybody? I'm so thankful and honored to be on. Listen, I'm excited to have you on. I have been a follower of yours for quite some time now, and then you all of a sudden just blew up out of nowhere. (laughs) Yeah, God is good. It is. So right here on the Morning Jam Podcast, we'd like to start off with, tell us your name since I've already said it, and where you're from. Well, my name is Vance Olds. I'm from Washington, D.C. All my life, born and reared. And I'm so thankful for the opportunity. That is awesome. Uh, Well, Bishop, I want to start where, um, let's start back in the day where all this swag and all this coolness come from. (laughs) (laughs) Well, well, um, to be candid with you, it was from those that came before us. Uh, of course, the the men that were in my life was always wanting to be clean and dress good. Uh, of course, I was born in the '60s, so in the in the, in the '70s, in the mid '70s, you know, the men dressed a certain way. They went yes. a certain way, so they was always sharp and clean. And um, I got attracted to it because all the girls used to like my older brothers and older men in the neighborhood, and so. I thought if I follow that that lead or that example, that I can get me a couple of girls too, as a young boy. And so I started dressing and I started to uh, put things together. And before you know it, it just became a natural thing. It's like I have an eye for fashion. And uh, with a swag, I, I guess that's that's an attitude of uh, confidence. <laughs> um, that's just simply an attitude of confidence of knowing you know, really who you are and, and being able to appreciate what you are. And so it's not even about fashion. It's not even about style. It's just about being who you are, you know, and that. that right. I think I need to get some of that because, you know, I have to get a little confident in my uh, my style as well and who I am as a person, too. So I love fashion. I'm into makeup as well, but I have to I can you know, I got that swagness with the makeup, but I got to get that, you know, with the clothes and stuff like you. I was actually showing my son before I moved to Atlanta, uh, Georgia. Um the pictures and everything about you. He was like, that man got some swag. Bishop got swag. And, you know, he just was really just fell into uh, your personality. He follows you and everything. And I, he was just really, just really uh, just admiring how you are as a bishop and just uh, how you carry yourself. That's incredible. That's incredible. <laughs> so there's a big difference between swag and dressing because people can put on something, the same thing you have and don't have the same <clears throat> this way I think that your fashion or the natural character absolutely so. and I, I I definitely think yours matched you <laughs> very well <clears throat> so I want to uh speak with you on you say uh how your your fashion should match your personality so let's get into what if that is covering up something something meaning in hurt and mm. what people have been through in life I know that a lot of times we look at people and they have um, on the outside looks good, but the inside is, is broken and hurt. Sure. Um, I talk a lot, a lot about that in my book um, from Cocaine to Carla, how I was a dressed up garbage can that I looked like Masashi on the outside and felt like Kmart on the inside. Wow. On the front to cover up the pain. Even when I was um, in a drug game and using crack cocaine, I still covered up. I still dress well. And people will ask me, why, how in the world can you dress so good and be on crack? Well, I couldn't pawn my clothes. Mm-hmm. <laughs> right. <laughs> I pawned my jewelry and all that stuff, but you couldn't pawn your clothes. And so after I would go on my binge and my binge with, with crack cocaine, I would go home, take a shower, and put on a brand new outfit because I never gained weight. I'm the same size that I was in high school. The same oh, size. Oh, wow. So, the same size. And so my clothes and what I buy is classic stuff, but I would, um, so it won't, it don't go out of style. My suits and stuff, I buy two button suits, <laughs> regular size. So they, you know, I don't buy a lot of bell bottoms. I don't buy a lot of skinny. I buy just <laughs> slim. 
and it never goes out of style. And so wow, that's awesome. yeah, <laughs> I have covered up uh, a lot of pain through my addiction, a lot of uh, uh, things that I've gone through as a child, even in terms of um, being overlooked, um, mm -hmm. being um, the insignificant one or the rowdy one or the wild one or the most one that per persons would think that wouldn't succeed. So I would have mm -hmm. to always do extra as a young man, whether I was playing sports, I had to do extra because I was small. I had to stay on the court longer than those. Anything I did, I had to do extra because I wanted to be noticed. I wanted to be seen. I wanted my family. It started with my family. Um, mm -hmm. I wanted them to notice me. I, I, I wanted to be up front sometime. And yeah. um, I had other cousins that they put in front of me and um, I would do extra to try to get attention. And so whatever it was to get their attention, I did it. And so that's what happened. I started hanging out with the older guys around the neighborhood because I wanted to be accepted. I wanted mm -hmm. to be accepted. I wanted to be a part of. And unfortunately, you know, their life wasn't so positive. They was into women, drugs, and clothes, and gangs, and all that type of stuff. So I gravitated to that. And I hid that. And I started using drugs to hide the pain yeah. of yeah. the And so... But uh, thank that was, God. I was going to ask you that too. I was going to ask you. So, what what the the men and what kind of you know <laughs> effect that they have on your life? But you answered that question. So, Players, and that's it. Yeah, <laughs> pimping. They were, you know, they had the women. They had the clothes. They had it was cool. Um, they they had notoriety. They was popular. Everybody in the city loved them. Back there in the day, it wasn't like these young cats today killing each other and acting all stupid. It was. It was smooth. It was cool. You were you yeah. were you were a neighborhood guy. You were respected. Um, it was a difference, and so that looked good. And that attention took me somewhere else. You know, mm -hmm. then when I got addicted, that's a whole different game, a whole different monster. So I'm hiding the pain, but yet with an addiction to um, continue to do things outside of me to make me feel better, it became worse. Wow. Wow. So what high school did you go to? I went to a, a school in Maryland called Supin High School. And okay. um, it was a pretty rowdy high school. It was a pretty challenging, competitive, tough high school, you know, but I was pretty popular in high school because I played basketball and I dressed good and I played okay. music. So I was pretty popular in high school. And so you so, didn't start any of the drugs until, you know, after you met up with the older gentleman or was it in high school as well? Well, I started smoking weed. They call it marijuana. I started smoking <laughs> reefer herb. They called it when I came up. They, I started smoking weed at 12 in the seventh grade. Oh, wow. Yeah, yeah. I was addicted to weed uh, at 12. I got caught selling weed in elementary school in ninth grade. And so, wow. and then, you know, I started smoking weed because all my family, my uncles and everybody, it was, it was socially accepted. You know, back mm -hmm. then, it gotcha. was cool. And so I started smoking weed and got addicted to weed every day. I smoked weed all through high school. I didn't start snorting cocaine until I went to Howard University. I got a music scholarship from Howard University. I mean, I'm sorry, I got a music scholarship from Suitland to Howard. So I was at Howard University at 17 on a drum line in the marching band. Wow. So wow. Um, at 18, I started snorting coke, cocaine, lying wow. cocaine. <laughs> and then the movie Scarface finally came out, and everybody wanted to be cool like Scarface. So we went <laughs> and our cars popped in and, and nice Italian suits, and you know, and so everybody wanted to do that. So I started snorting cocaine, and then I finally um, got caught up with with, with freebasin cocaine. About twenty years old, I was strung out on crack and um, cocaine at twenty one. And so, so, can you tell me the difference in between those? Well, 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 the powder coat, the, the crack cocaine is at its purest form. Well, I, let, me, let me put it this way. When you, you can, you can, what they call cook powder cocaine, that it will mm -hmm. come to a purest form in uh, a hard rock. And okay, you, can, gotcha. you can smoke that, right? It's at its purest form. And it just gives you a high to make you want more. It's quicker. Snorting cocaine, you can snort it. You know, you have a 50 of cocaine, you can snort it all day, two days. Yeah. You can snort a 50 of crack cocaine or cook cocaine in less than 50 minutes. And so oh, wow. really, really, really 
facts. And in the city of DC in the mid eighties, when I got on the cocaine, that was the most craziest time in Washington DC. The mid eighties was the most craziest. It was the murder capital of the world. Um, it was just crazy during those times. I'm thankful to God that I got out. <laughs> Absolutely, and we're thankful to God that you got out. I was born in the 80s. I'm an 81, 1981, yeah. baby. <laughs> so um, I'm glad that that your life has drastically changed from uh, being addicted to cocaine and all of that, and now where you are in your life. Um, I'm so appreciative. I'm so glad to see uh, such a man like yourself, a bishop in church, yeah. Um, and the church is the living, um, Lord, I'm sorry. It's not living. It's the Liberty house, um, yes. is your church now international yes. ministries. And, and I'm so grateful. So, um, so how, what made you want to start a church? Well, um, long short, it has always been in me to preach the gospel and love God. Mm -hmm. I got saved. Well, my grandfather was a Baptist pastor. And so my mother, her sisters and brothers, they grew up in church. So mm -hmm. uh, church was not foreign to me. I was raised in church. You know, you can be in church, but church not in you. And that's what I was. I was smoking weed going to church. I played yeah. drums <laughs> high, literally, on the drums. Wow, okay. I, I told you I, I got high when I was 12. So I remember at 13 years old, in the eighth grade, smoking a joint, a J. I'm on the way to church on Sunday morning and get on them drums and play. And they wow, that's amazing. That's amazing. They, wouldn't, they wouldn't put me out of church. And so <laughs> um, I forgot. I, I, I got lost. I got backtracked. I got backtracked. What was the question? I, I was lost. asking you what made you want to uh, start a church, the okay, church. Okay. So, mm -hmm. so born and raised in church. And, and um, they always thought I would be a preacher. Um, and so when I got off of crack, um, 30 years ago, I've been clean. I've been drug free almost 30 years. Wow, congratulations. So, uh, That's amazing. Yeah, God is good. God is good. I yes, got locked up. I got locked up in 93 and um, I never looked back. And so when I, when I um, finally got clean, got myself together, I was attending church again. And mm -hmm. so uh, I was playing piano and, and keyboards for my pastor. He's dead and gone now. And um, one day he just asked me, he was like, uh, you ready? I knew exactly what he was talking about. And I said, yeah. And so it was um, 1995. Um, and he said, uh, you can preach your first sermon. So I preached my first sermon. I became a licensed preacher. So I started doing ministry. I was just in ministry, serving, mm -hmm. um, learning ministry. Then I went to, uh, I went to a seminary, got my degree um, in religious education. And um joined another ministry, and I was uh, the leader of evangelism. I did street ministry. I did door knocking, um, street ministry, marketplace ministry. I was an outside dude, because I'm a street dude. Right, so, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you found your I, calling, that's what it was. <laughs> 85, 90 people under my ministry that would go out, we would go out every day, gas stations, we would go to clubs on Friday nights. And I noticed when I was going to clubs, I'm gonna tell you how the ministry started. This is my previous church before I passed. It. Okay. So when we go to clubs, I, I witnessed people pouring out their beers and everything. People knew me from the street, like, well, you out here doing this? I'm like, man, come on, you can come on in, da da da. And I noticed I would people would get saved, but they would still be stuck in the street. Mm -hmm. And you couldn't, you know, they give their life to Christ, but we had nowhere to put them. If they was on drugs and they get saved, they give their life to Christ, we had nowhere to put them. We had to leave them right there on the corner. And that right, was yeah. that agitated me. That ministry was building into me then, out there in those streets. And so I got to the point, I was so zealous. I was telling my pastor, can we take the chairs out of the, the sanctuary during the week since we're not here and put some beds in here? That's oh, wow. I was just that that bad radical, like, man, we only get here on Sundays and Tuesday nights all during the week. The building is empty. Can we put some beds in here so when we go out and minister and witness and, 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 and save souls in the street? They have somewhere to come and eat and lay down, da, da, da. but that never worked. And so I was gonna say, did that happen? Did that ever no, happen? That, that that never happened. <laughs> and so and so I served at that ministry for like 10 years. After I that left my previous church for so 10 years. And the Lord spoke to me and said he wanted me to pastor before I was 40. And so 
I got the name Liberty House because my ministry is a, a deliverance ministry. And so one of my visions was to provide 100,000 bed spaces, which provides help for anybody, whether you're on drugs, whether you're battered, whether you're going through, whether you're homeless, whether you're hurting, it doesn't matter. And so I got two recovery houses now that serve the same purpose I served me when I got all the drugs. It's a sober wow. living again for alcohols and drugs. And so, yeah, you, you going started, directly into the, into the question I was going to ask you, I was like, okay, we're going to talk about the Liberty Sober Living, uh, recovery house that yeah, you have. Yeah. So, yeah. and how many, how many beds and how many beds and how many, you said two locations. Yeah. We're working on the second one now. We just got a couple of things to do, but seven per, uh, per house, seven men, you know, and it wow. takes, it takes, it's, it's really a work because, um, the state of Maryland really doesn't give a lot of money for drug addiction. I know it's grants, but it's, it's very slim. They get right. money to use um, seniors, all kinds of stuff. But for drugs and alcohol, there's no money. And so if you get a house and you have a mortgage on a house and you're dealing with alcohols, alcoholics and drug addicts that's having a hard time getting a job, how do you maintain that house? Because you got a mortgage. See, they got the, it's not free. It's a sober living house. Right. After they come out of rehab, they come to the sober living environment. And they the state gives us two months of, of money. But after that, they got to work. If they don't get a job, right. they pay. That means I have to pay out of my pocket the mortgage, the utilities. So it's not an easy, it's not an easy job. You got to have a heart for it. Um, right. You got to have a heart for it. Or because sometimes it doesn't make business sense. But mm -hmm. many that business sense. Ministry is a love for it. I give back because it was given me, but it's tough. Every, it, it's Houses have closed during the pandemic because they can't afford it. When the pandemic right. hit, they couldn't go to work. So persons had to pay for them houses with the men staying in there with no money coming in. And wow. So, yeah. So yeah, it's tough. I'm glad. Yeah. I'm definitely glad that your house has sustained itself through the pandemic and everything. So uh, and that's one thing. I mean, I have brothers that have been in prison and um, I always wondered, you know, the lifestyle that, you know, they've been in there for multiple years and even on drugs and stuff and how that they're, that they're coming out and they haven't been out in the world for a very long time. So how do they handle being back into the world and to the society of, of, back is is right there open hand now everything is so open so drugs is like right there for you know well, for them to get even right back started and drinking and all that stuff too so it's yeah. always been a, a thought of mine of how can we start something and i guess your sober house is one um to liberty sober uh, house is just one to just help different men and and just really start all over again because that's what i love i love it that that they can start all over again like you said in one of your clips you said today is a brand new day yeah but even if you're having a bad day you can still start all over again <laughs> let, me tell you let me tell you something a sober living house for alcoholics and drug addicts is absolutely uh, a necessity because living in a rehab and going straight to the street is a culture shock. And yeah. then culture shock is a trigger to an addict. It's a trigger. So them transitioning from the rehab to a sober living house gives them a, a transitional time to uh, restock their mind. Um, mm -hmm. Instead of in the street right off of rehab and being yeah. in culture shock. So it worked for me. I, I had to go into a, a recovery house. And so I know what it did for me. It gave me a great, a great start, great structure. And so when it was time for me to go into society, I had the tools and I had the conditioning by being in the recovery house. I tell the guys, what you do here right now, it's what you're going to do when you leave. And right. so it gave me the opportunity to get back on my feet. I'm grateful. Yeah. So I know you have spoke about, um, you know, getting uh, out of the way of different ones that's in, um, that have hit hard spots. Yeah. And, you know, family, we tend to be like, come on, I know you can do better. I know you can do this. But we yeah. tend to get in the way a lot of times when people are going through things in life. And um, uh, like you said, it, it delays their deliverance. It, 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 and you said when they hit rock bottom is where the foundation starts all over again to where they can really start all over again. Can you talk about that a little bit? 
you've been investigating me. <laughs> that's my thing. You did, if you did, denied their pain, you delayed their deliverance. And your yeah. rock bottom is your solid foundation. Those are my, my coin phrases. And that's in yeah. any, whether it's addiction, whether it's relationships, we have to allow that people the, the, uh, the freedom to hit their bottom. We have to let people go. We have to love them enough to allow them to go through what they go through, whether it's drugs, alcohol, whether it's relationships, whatever it is. If it's causing their life to be unmanageable, you have to allow them to go through the necessary pain. Pain is the motivator. Um, that right. Do anything to get on top of your life. And so um, that's the, the, the serenity prayer is God, set, God grant me the serenity to set the things I cannot change. I can't change you. Mm -hmm. And to change the things I can, I can change me and the wisdom to know the difference. What's ours yeah. and what's yours. And so um, it's, it's a wisdom piece. We enable people. And what saved me may kill you. So it's not for everybody. My mother didn't put right. me out. Some mother need, might need to put their child out. My mother put me on the altar. You know, she didn't put me out. But some uh, may need to be put out. So I'm not telling you to do what I did oh, yeah. or what my mother did. But, you know, what works for me may not work for somebody else. So you got to know what God wants. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Um, I know we're going to go back a little bit here. How, uh, one, how you was on Steve Harvey show and he gave you the skates to Stacey Adams. I watched it, I watched it and I was so excited. At home. I was like, what is in this box? I was like, Ariel Bishop, open it. <laughs> so, so how was that meeting Steve Harvey and all of that and what he has given you? And now uh, you've did a lot of YouTube now on your single that is out power featuring Fred Hammond and the seven souls. So let's talk about that a little bit. Yeah, that was amazing. That was an amazing moment. It's all God to be perfectly honest with you. I mean, um, I can't take the credit for none of it, you know, so I don't have a right to brag or boast. It was all God's timing, his plan. Um, many persons don't even know they see me skating during a pandemic. And um, it brings them joy and um, give them energy. But I literally um, got locked up on skates. Mm. I literally got arrested on skates. And so um, how God planned that is absolutely phenomenal. You know, I didn't know in 93, skating in the middle of the street, selling drugs, that in 2020, it would be a pandemic and I'm skating in the street clean. I was yeah. carrying Christ, I'm carrying Christ. God, that's God's story. I had nothing to do with it. Um, I only made a vow to God. I told Mr. Harvey, I made a vow to God. I told Smokey North when he was interviewing me one day, he said, um, why you do what you do? Why you write your book? I made a vow to God. In my mm -hmm. cell, it's in 20 years, no parole. I said, God, you get me out of here, I tell the world. So now he's yeah. given me that form to tell the world. So it was amazing when Steve Harvey asked me to come on the show. Um, it was uh, it was amazing. It was an amazing time. It was an opportunity for me to carry God's name again, and um, that's the secret sauce. I mean, if you're a creator, if you are you are artist, you you branding a, a business, anything you're doing, the secret sauce is if you promote God, He'll promote you. So I told mm -hmm. God, my, wherever I go, I'm gonna carry His name. And so I had an opportunity to do that. That's the biggest part for me. I had an opportunity to um, stay to my vow because I could have went up there and talked about all kinds of stuff. You oh, know, yeah. I could have talked about all my successes. I didn't have to show my dirt. I didn't have to show my wounds. But Paul said that I will glorify my affirmatives that the power of Christ may rest upon me for when I'm weak, then I'm strong. And so I don't sit around and tell you how many degrees I got and um, and I'm doing this and I'm doing that. Who cares? People want to hear where you've been. You cannot pull me out if you ain't been in. And so, oh, that's good. so I thank God for the opportunity for the platform to be able to share that. And we talked longer than that. We were, we were talking like 45 minutes. I said a whole lot <laughs> of stuff. You know, so it was exciting. It was good. My wife enjoyed it. It was a great opportunity. And they, you know, they wanted to, to, to pitch the story, the story of me. Yeah skating and when God made my name great skating who would ever think skating and people right this is what I'm telling you because I'm telling you this because it's all God 
is because people can skate circles around me. I'm not even doing nothing. I'm an older guy, I skate smooth. In my city, I got some young cats can do what I do and do all kinds of stuff. But God knows who gonna carry his name. That's true. That's the secret sauce. And so I give it all to him. So whatever God does, however he does it, whenever he wants to do it, I'm gonna tell the truth. Nothing but the truth, the whole truth. <laughs> how, he, how he delivered me, how he pulled me out, how he brought me over, how he took me in, how he covered me, how he blessed me. It's all God, and I'm sticking to it. Well, I'm glad that you're sticking to it because it's amazing. I want to talk about this before we even talk about your song, uh, Power. Um, yeah. You had mentioned um, you won't fix what you won't face. Oh, yeah, yeah. God, God, God can't fix it. I mean, he can do what he wants to, but God, I mean, you, you have to, you have to face wherever you are. I mean, you have to admit what you got, you got. And, it, and I'm not talking about drugs. I mean, people mm -hmm. struggle on relationships, they struggle on men, women, food, everything. And, yeah. and face it. You have to admit it first. In order for you to get the help you need in the hospital, you have to be admitted. Mm -hmm. Right. Right. So, I think a lot of time people, um, they don't want to face that. Like you're saying, they don't want to face it. One, it could bring that hurt, that mm -hmm. pain, even, uh, old situations, old pain that has been in the past yeah. onto what they're facing. So I think when people bury a lot of things, they don't want to face that too. And it brings up the, all of that. Like, it's like when you peel, when you have a scab on a sore and you tend yeah. to pick it, there's, oh, there's that one spot that's still sensitive on that. So you still leave that scab right there and you don't want to get into it, but all yeah. the rest of it is healed. So a lot yeah. of times people just tend to just pick around that sore and be like, okay. And this is like picking around our lives. What makes us look good, what makes us feel good, but we really need to dig deep on the inside of us because that's where it starts, the inside. My yeah. outside can look just as good and amazing, but that inside is just so wore out and it's, it's hurting, it's got anxiety, it's got depression, it's got a whole bunch of stuff. And people don't want to face that. But a lot, a lot of times God uses us when we're at our lowest, like you said, at our lowest and our rock bottom. I, yeah. I've been there, uh, Bishop, I, I'm... I, I, I told even God, if you let me live to see another day, yeah. I was facing cancer. I was, I was battling sarcoidosis and my lungs was not well. I had sores, what they call lesions on my leg. And if I bumped up on anything, it hurt me like to my core, to my soul. Mm -hmm. And I remember um, on all of these medications and like facing that. And I would call my sister because she lived right next door. I was like, I need you to pray with me. I was so in pain. And I remember this particular day that I, it had me, I was sitting on the couch in my living room and I was like, God, if you don't heal me, I'm not going to make it. I'm not going to survive. And I called my sister over and I was having a back spasm. And my back was just tightening up really bad. And I was leaning over and I was going, <gasps> I mean, like, <gasps> like this. And my lungs was like, I was like, okay, God, if you don't heal me, I'm not going to survive. And I know that when people are in, in their hurt and in their pain and their suffering, they want just the truth. They yeah. want that, like, God, I need it now. They don't want it later. They don't want it in a few hours. God, I need it right now. Has there been a point in your life? I know you said you're a survivor of 30 years now. Yeah. Life where you said, God, I need your help. This is my breaking point. I'm, oh, yeah. I'm willing to face this to, get, to be healed. Oh, yeah. I remember that night, like, like yesterday, I was in my mother's house and, um, my mother, God bless her, she gone home to be with the Lord. She was in the room praying for me. Mm -hmm. I had my pipe in my hand and I was tired. Mm -hmm. uh, I wanted to stop but couldn't stop, but I was tired. I knew that my yeah. life, that I was stealing money from her. Let me just back up right quick. Um, secrets grow in the dark, then die in the light. That was the key to freedom me when I started mm -hmm. being able to share about my lows without worrying about how people saw me. So my mother was, uh, she was she was in the room praying in tongue. And I remember her, like like her, her voice rang, rung like a bell in the house. She said, this is my boy and he's not what he's doing. And so I said this, I said, God, I said, I said, Lord, if you be real with this crap pipe in my hand, I mm -hmm. never, if you be real, deliver me from these drugs, I'm tired. 
delivered me from these drugs. I got up off my knees, right? I went right back around the strip, still selling drugs, getting high, but that was my breaking point. Mm -hmm. Two weeks later, God sent angels after me in the phone of PG County police. <laughs> <laughs> so I didn't, right. get, I didn't get arrested, I got rescued. But I called out on God, I said, I can't do it no more. I know I messed up and he came and delivered me and I got locked up on them skates. Right. So, yeah. And so during the process of me growing as a man, I had to do some self inventory. I had to face some stuff. I had to clear up some wreckage of my past. I had to talk about some stuff that I hid because mm. what, what secrets does uh, or do rather, they tap you on the shoulder, especially at the time when you're doing well and say, yeah. don't me and so when you expose them and you share them it dies in the dark so there's some things that i was sharing with the men in my ministry the other day that blew their mind and i was like i'm not worried about how none of y'all see me i don't care i exposed it i'm a free man i'm a free man i'm a free bishop i, I live the way i live in public as i live in private i have nothing to hide if i go right. out to I'm gonna dance in Jamaica. I'm gonna dance right here at the house. And I'm not gonna worry about nobody seeing me. I'm a free man. I have nothing to hide. And that's the key to freedom of getting honest. Because we got self made prisons in our own mind, even in our profession. So true. Because we won't keep it real. We won't get transparent. We won't get honest. We won't let people know we struggle. We go through from day to day. And that's the key to my ministry. My, my ministry is transparency. That's how folk are getting touched and getting blessed and getting delivered and want to come back to God because yeah. it's somebody that's authentic and real and legitimate and valid and been through it and ain't shame to talk to you at any given day. I can go through it. I tell people all the time, I'm one hit away from stealing your pocketbook. One hit. After 30 years of being clean, I'm one hit away of robbing you to get out of here. So I'm grateful. I'm humble. Um, and that's, that's real talk. Like I have yeah. nothing to have. Yeah. So what do you, so how do you handle, um, I know the positivity of you being this uh, amazing bishop. So how do you handle the negativity that comes your way? I watched a video and I was kind of like looking side eyed, like for real, are you really saying this? So how do you handle the negative that comes your way as well while you're at where you're at, you're in your place now. Man, listen. I allow God to handle it. I, a giraffe never responds to a turtle. Okay. Got it? No, I have not. I'm waiting on you to explain that. <laughs> a giraffe I got never, you. <laughs> never responds to a turtle. His neck is created to look higher. And it will, it will, he will literally have a heart attack to bend down. It will break your heart to bend down. And Got then you. I have to respect the turtle's view. That's what they see. That's I good. change it. You don't <laughs> see what I see. So a giraffe, I like, I like that. I, I really like that. Go ahead. I'm sorry. <laughs> so a giraffe never responds to a turtle, and I respect your view. I don't have to rebuttal. I don't have to clap back. I don't have to defend. And most people who go on you, they 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 got two followers. It's spam, or it could be a, a troll. So I don't give them no attention. I used to. It used to break my heart because they don't know how authentic I really am. Right. Because yeah. You know, you, you know, you're doing something when people hate you and don't even know you. <laughs> exactly. Like you, you got enough time you. in the world. To talk yeah. about little old me. <laughs> yeah. So that's what I do. I, I see it and, and and I have several times used as a teaching moment. I won't clap back in public on my main post. I go back and, and inbox them and try to help them. It sets up oh. for me to teach. And I have seen people dwindle down and say, Bishop, I'm sorry. I have people call me back and have to apologize to me. That's so good. At first glance, they saw and they saw me dance and and you know, I'm a small fellow. So anytime you dance, anytime you dance, unless you're just doing hand dances, like you're chilling. Right. <laughs> if you move any kind of way, your hips normally gotta move. 
They just, you cannot do a foot dance and your hips stay stiff. I prohibit everything. One time I did a TikTok and my wife said, you can't put that on me. <laughs> well, I said, baby, you won't let me be great. You won't let me be great. No, I <laughs> Let's talk about this sweetheart that's been behind you for quite some time. Let's talk uh, about Miss O. So how is how has that been for you? Got that queen standing beside you. I see her on TikTok doing her thing with you. Oh man. <laughs> it's 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 amazing. It's it's amazing because my wife is very reserved. My wife is reserved. She's not the typical first lady. My wife don't run around speaking in tongue and hot. My wife don't do that. <laughs> My wife is watchful. She's watchful. <laughs> She's gifted in observing. She watched. That's, that, but that's good though. Yeah. I'm I'm the all over the place one. I'm the energetic, motivated people person. We compliment. My wife calms me down. She takes your time. She looks at people. This one ain't right. This one ain't for you. And uh it makes sense to listen to who God sent to help you. Yeah, I can actually say that about my boyfriend. He definitely calms me down. I'm like, you gonna chill for a minute, relax. <laughs> you I'm home. like you, Bishop. I got a lot of energy. I like to talk and all yeah. of that, so. <laughs> and it's good, you know, it, it, it's a great balance. But my wife, you know, she's coming out of the shell. She was not social media driven she didn't know how to do the apps then my wife does do all that stuff by herself she do got her own page got her own instagram page she do her own little stuff and so you don't uh, have to go follow her now see i thought you guys had y'all page together i'm not, uh, together i'm gonna have to follow her now <laughs> we have our own separate pages but we do uh stuff together on my page and do stuff on her page but she got her own separate thing lady oh she's she like eighty thousand followers on instagram wow <laughs> Yeah, nice little. She got a nice following on Instagram, man. They Wait, on Instagram, you just got five forty-seven. Yeah, something like that. Well, she beating you. <laughs> huh? Is she beating you? Did you no, say she have eight hundred? Seventy thousand, eighty thousand. Oh, got you, got you. I was gonna say what? <laughs> okay, Miss Oz, I see you. <laughs> well, so let's. Let's get into, I know we can talk about your wife because well, I don't want to put her on blast. This is about, about you and uh, your song called Power. Right. Uh, featuring Fred Hammond and the seven uh, soul, uh, son, what is, souls, right? Another soul, what yes. am I? Yeah, souls. So let's, yeah. let's talk about this song, Power. It is, to me, amazing. I didn't even know that you could sing. Wow, I can't sing right now, horse. I would sing for you. Go ahead, Bishop. I don't have a voice right now. I preached you don't have last a voice? Night. I preached you preach? I have a horse. I preached last night and I uh, got really, really excited. And so my, yeah. voice, my voice got That's big. what happens when God uses you get excited. Yeah, I got excited, lost my voice. And so uh I want to kind of take care of it so I can be okay for Sunday. Yeah. But, yeah. yeah. Song power. Power. Yeah. Absolutely great, a great song. And preaching with Fred Hammond and the Seven Sons of Soul. It's a it's a story behind it, and it's it's mm -hmm. it's it's awesome. It's, 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 it is it's, awesome. It's awesome. So, what made you want to uh, do it with Fred Hammond? Was it your song that you wrote, or was it something that he collabed well, and just wanted? Let me tell you how I went. Now, like I told you before, I've been in music like practically all my life. You know, I was playing keyboards and drums at 12, 13 high. Went to Howard yeah. University on a music scholarship, full tuition to Howard. And um, had a lot of history in music with my family, with the R&B. And we were, we were really close to getting a record deal with RCA and okay. had some, some murder in my family. So music has always been, you know, a president in my life. And so I did a lot of local quartet gospel stuff in the city. And so- oh, okay. Seven Sons of Soul, they're good friends of mine because we're in the city together. I've known them 30, 40 years. And wow. so I've been teasing with them for years, man. I'm a, you know, because I've been playing quartet groups all over the, you know, the city, the local groups. I've been playing for everybody, you know, sung with everybody, backed up everybody, you know. <laughs> and, and so I'll be teasing with Clip, man. I'm, I'm going to get my single out because I got a studio myself. I write, I engineer, I got my own stuff down my basement. So wow. I've been for years. And I was like, man, I'm going to do a single. 
So he said, come on studio, let me um, let you hear a couple of songs. I said, cool, bet. I went over there, we started throwing some stuff out, some instrumentals. And so I broke up, and I was like, that's cool, that's nice. Then um, he let me hear power. It was no music to it. I mean, it was no lyrics to it. He just let me hear the beat. Because at the time, okay. I was talking, you know, I was dancing. I knew what was vibing. I knew what was trending. I knew the type of beat to look for that was moving in the TikTok era. And I wanted something that I could place on there and maybe get a dance challenge to push it even more, right? So I was right. like, oh, that's the song right there. That's it right there. And so they said, cool. I said, well, let me, you got lyrics to it? They said, yeah. So they let me hear the lyrics. And when I started hearing the lyrics, the lyrics literally label and define my life of transformation. Right like having power over the enemy, where I come from in this yeah. era doing right now was perfect in a pandemic. It fits me perfect. Now I could have used my songs. I could have used anything I wanted, but uh, thank God for them. They allowed me to do that. We worked out some deals with that, by me being an artist on the song and you know, we, we cut it, da, 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 da. And so meanwhile, so I was in the studio doing that stuff. We had somebody on the song and um, the backtrack, during the pandemic, um, Fred, um, Fred had hit me. I'd never known Fred personally before the pandemic. Okay. This is brand new. Now I was been a fan of Fred all my life playing music. Right. And Legend. so, so you know, so when I went viral and dancing and stuff, he he hit me on the inbox, on Instagram, like man, you know, keep doing what you're doing. You inspiring, man. You you cutting edge. You doing some stuff that you know. Da 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 da. I said, cool. Bang. And so what happened through that relationship when he hit when he hit me, that was a relationship. Yeah. Like I was surprised like his family called me, you know what I mean? And so he said I remind him of one of his guys in the group, whatever, 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 whatever. Because he I think he posted something. I was dancing and he reposted it. Yeah. And hit me. And then I said, uh, I said, okay. So I wrote my <laughs> book. I, I I um I released my book December. 2020, the Lord said, you need to have this book before 2020 is over. So December 1, 2020, I released my book. And so I called and I was like, Fred, I, I mean, I, I DM'd him, I was like, Fred, can you, uh, can you plug the book in with me? I got a new book, I'm gonna bring you on my live, right? He's like, cool. I was like, wow, I got Fred in heaven. Yeah. <laughs> You know, I went on Instagram and da 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 da. We talked about the book, da 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 da. Boom. So that was a relationship again. And so Fred ended up catching COVID later on. He caught it a while back. Right. He did one of his songs and I skated to him. I told him, I'm going to skate to your song and encourage you. I skated to one of his songs, sent it to him, da 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 da. I think that joint did like 600,000 views, something like that. <laughs> and I like, you know, it, it kind of moved. It was kind of cool. I yeah. My suit. Bang, 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 bang. <laughs> <laughs> kind of did that. And so we got a relationship now. So uh, I called him, man, how you doing? Da, 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 da. We talked. We were talking one day on the phone. I'm talking to Fred Ammon, like literally. Like I'm talking to Fred Ammon. I could, I was, <laughs> in the beginning, I was floored. Smoking open said, you need to stop acting like that. You need to be floored only by God. Right? <laughs> right. <laughs> Normal. You need a, and he said, if you don't recognize your own significant, you're going to start missing blessings because you're going to think you're not significant. Yeah. Stop thinking that way. And so I'm on the phone with Fred. And at the time, Fred working on his album and stuff. It's a true story. Fred working on his album and telling me about the music business, how it changed. And, and you know, it's changed drastically, like literally how it changed. And, um, and I said, man, you know, I'm working on a single. I'm working on a song, man. Uh, he said, what, you play? I said, man, I've been playing for years. I play keys, I sing, I, you know, I write, you know, I play instruments, you know, I do backgrounds, I teach, I do all that. But he was like, what? You kidding me? I said, yeah. He said, let me hear the song. Oh, so I said, I had the song on my laptop. I put it up on speakerphone, I played the song. At the time, somebody else was doing the second verse. And so I played the song. And he said, let me get on that. He was playing with me. I thought he was playing. <laughs> yeah, said, he thought. I'm like, like that's not playing. Quit playing. <laughs> Fred, you want to get on my mind? I ain't nobody. You want to get on there? 
He said, stop playing. I think he was playing at first too. I think he was just playing because I, I, you know, I think he was playing, but the Holy Ghost must spoke to him and uh -huh. said, do that later. He told me, man, the Spirit of God told me, man, to do it for you. And so wow. he said, let me get on there. I said, stop playing. So I called seven songs. So I called Cliff, uh, Cliff Jones and David Lindsay who produced the song. And I was like, man, Fred want to get on. And they was like, bet. And so I called Fred, long, short. Uh -huh. Fred got on the song. Holy Spirit wow. must spoke to him and do relationship and say, man, you know, I want to help you. You know, I don't do this much. And, um, but I think he was playing at first just out of relationship. <laughs> yeah, just, just out of relationship. Okay, yeah. yeah. Okay, since you act, since you had the nerve to ask me, I'll go ahead and be on it with you. Right. <laughs> he got on and um, he liked the song. And that's it. That's how that went. Like, wow. And again, again now, again, it's all God. Right. It's right. All God. So, where's the name of the song, Power? Where did that I come from? Uh, actually, you know, uh, I didn't write the song. Mm -hmm. I didn't write the song. Um, you probably have to ask David Lindsay or the person who wrote the song. Okay. <laughs> I just labeled, I just, it labeled me. It fit me for the period I'm in and, and the period the world is in. It, right. it, it, it couldn't fit nobody else but me. Right. So what are you wanting, wanting your listeners to get out of hearing the song Power? I really want them to know that power is available for anybody who's in anything. Mm -hmm. Power is available. Um, mm -hmm. And the world needs to know that. Whatever or whoever your enemy is that you can conquer, right. that there's power available um, and that you don't have to turn back, that yeah. there's no more turning back. Can nothing stop you, you're unstoppable. Especially when you're in the power of God you know, the Bible says in Ephesians 3 20 that he's able to do a seating abundantly above all that we can ask or think according to the power right within us. Mm -hmm. There's power already in the believer to overcome anything, and I don't care what it is. And it kind of matches my book, everything. My book, it was just my book is it's literally talking about it gives hope to anybody that they can recover from anything. Anything. Yeah. yeah. And you surprise how many people we see that we think that they really doing their thing and they struggle and they're going through is secretly discouraged. Many pastors, um, especially during the pandemic, a lot of musicians, the music industry, people are hurting and they need to know yeah. they can back and don't have to turn back. So the song, it labeled me, it stamped me, it it defined my life of transformation. Yeah. And so I'm not the man I used to be because of the power. That's amazing. Um, I definitely can say too, uh, Bishop, by even just listening to you and uh, hearing your motivation and, and inspiration, that's, it's, it's an inspiration to me. It motivates me. Um, I moved here in September of last year. Um, I never stopped traveling because I came back, back and forth from Arkansas to, to here. Uh, to Georgia, you know, doing podcasting, doing interviews and doing red carpets, been at the Stella Awards, you know, different places that uh, doing that. But my inspiration always comes from the people that I have connected with and the ones that continue to pour into my life to say, even like when I'm at my moment of being, can I even do this? Can I make this move? Can I just can I even hear, can I make this move? Can I do this? And then I get a text from a friend like, Crystal, I see you keep, keep going, keep motivating, being inspired, be lifted, you know? And those are the ones that, that continue to stay in my life that I can really like, if I call on these people, they will be there for me. Do you have those ones that been even from your days of being on, on drugs and addicted to it? Can, do you have those ones that still be in your life today that is still in your life today that you can call on and they can just really like hey i see you bishop continue even with the negativity the positive that you got going on because i know that there's so much um like you said the enemy can tap you on the shoulder and like hey do you need mm -hmm. this you know you you once could couldn't do without it you know you need it do you right. have those friends that 
call you and say, hey, you still good? Well, to be to be perfectly honest, I really don't. But they're there. I really don't. Okay. I really don't talk to a lot of people. To be honest, even and as why pandemic, is that? Um, it hasn't always been like that. The pandemic made it even um, more stronger because mm-hmm. my members call me all the time, or I'm calling them. And it's a good thing that I'm not because I needed to develop more friendships. Pa- persons I pastor are not my friends. I'm their pastor. Right. Right. And because I didn't have none, I made them my friends. And mm-hmm. when you people, you lead your friends, disrespect or dishonor can creep in because a man is not honored in his own home. Mm-hmm. And so my friends or my dudes, you know, they still, they, I can call them a drop of the hat right now especially my skate guys dudes out you know they yeah. you know some do but i don't talk to nobody every day but my wife i don't talk to nobody i got pastor friends i have a bishop you know that i'm submitted to that covers me called him got pastor friends mm-hmm. that will be accountable keep me checked keep me balanced keep my feet on the ground but let me know when i'm off and will check right. me i got that in my life i'm not out here tripping you know, I got people in my life watch me and call mm-hmm. me. And these people that I respect and honor, they pushing me. Boy, you a breath of yeah. fresh air. You know what I mean? I'm yeah. talking people I respect. I got a bishop in Jacksonville, Florida that I was submitted to for 10 years that keeps me checked. Bishop Bob McLaughlin. Um, mm-hmm. a no nonsense man of God that's doing extremely well for over 35 years in Jacksonville. I don't know nobody go to Jacksonville, don't know him. You know, and so he keeps me grounded, he keeps me checked. You know, he busts my bubble, you know, right. people that will hold me accountable. I believe a pastor without a pastor is a lost pastor. I'm submitted. I give. I'm submitted. I'm open. I'm listening. And I'm growing. And those guys, you know, I value yeah. them. Tell me that, boy, you're doing good. I'm watching you. I'm following, I'm following you. And and so that, that kind of encourages me. Because in the beginning... You know, the church, the church threw me out of church. <laughs> <laughs> like, I'm, I'm a novice. Like, this don't happen. Bishops don't do this. Bishops don't, don't do this. <laughs> But that's not true. They get out of town. Right. <laughs> well, I definitely appreciate you, Bishop, uh, for being on here with me on the Morning Jam podcast. I know that you're a busy man. I look forward to reading your book. So I'm going to go uh, and purchase your book as well. I look forward to that. I cannot wait. Um, also, your song is amazing. You're amazing. That's all I can say. And that's one of my favorite words that I say all the time. Amazing. Because I know that God is amazing. And when he works and amazing ways amazing things happen so i appreciate you thank you for having thank you thank you for having me and i appreciate your time i know you're busy i'm honored and privileged to be able to share um at any time i'm really really oh no the honor is all mine it's all here (laughs) it's all here so let the people know where they can connect with you where they can get you for an interview and get your book and all of that well, um, it's actually Bishop O's everywhere, um, YouTube, Twitter, Facebook, um, Instagram, TikTok, um, <laughs> VanceOs.org. You can get an autographed copy of my book. Uh, you can go to Amazon and, and get my book. You can go to every digital outlet to get power. Um, it is on every digital outlet. And so Bishop O's everywhere. Um, Bishop O's, Bishop O's, Bishop O's. On Facebook, I have two accounts. <laughs> I have a digital creator account. That's Vance O's. My first name is Vance. That's why I dance a lot. Vance, 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 Vance. Vance, Vance. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> digital creator page, and I have a public figure page, Bishop O's. I normally go live on my ministry at church from my Bishop O's page, but you can find me there. And right, I'm, and you go live on uh, your ch- that's church, right, at 10, 10 a.m. Eastern Standard Time? <laughs> Yeah, 10 a.m. Eastern Time and um, 7 p.m. Eastern Time. We stream at least six ways. I'll be on Facebook, TikTok, YouTube, um, Instagram, and Twitter, and the website, www.LibertyHouseMinistries.com. So we stream six ways 
want to make sure that everybody get the opportunity to get the word of God and be strengthened and be motivated and inspired and encouraged to do what God called them to do. So it's awesome. good. Well, <laughs> awesome. Well, I look forward to uh, speaking with you soon about your song, how far it's going to go. I, I know it's going to go in a long way. It's going to be amazing. Uh, please follow me on Facebook under Crystal Whitaker, um, IG Bishop. I follow you. So you follow me back. All right, buddy. <laughs> All right, you guys, right here on the Morning Jam podcast with your sister and your friend, Crystal Whitaker. I'm right here with the one and only Bishop O's, you guys. Bishop, stay smooth. Peace out, guys. Peace. Bye. If you enjoyed this podcast, tune in each week on thinkingoutloudnetwork.com. Be sure to subscribe, hit that notification bell, and share with your friends and family. Until next time, peace.